Hi, this is The Philosophical Angle. I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Philosophical Equations of Economics. Another is The Nature of Aesthetics. These books can be viewed freely online at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me are our panelists, Mark Brennan. He's a professor of finance at New York University. And he's also the editor of the London Quarterly Review, established 1807. Also with me is Rick Samuelson. Rick graduated from Yale, has an MBA from Wharton and an MA from Tufts. And he's a retired investment banker. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to take current topics and, and concepts in media and define, and, uh, and define them and analyze their meaning. So with that, we're going to have today's topic, which is uh, an article from the New York Times, editorial page of April 29th, called The Economy Downshifts. <coughs> I'm going to read a couple of the paragraphs from this, uh, <coughs> short paragraphs from this article, and then we're going to discuss it. The economy downshifts. The slow start for the economy in 2012, an annual rate of 2.2% in the first three months of the year, is evidence <coughs> that the recovery is too weak to push joblessness much m lower than its current 8.2%, and too fragile to withstand the kinds of budget cuts and congr congressional Republicans are proposing. Fourth quarter was not far off. The recent average pace and conditions are certainly worse elsewhere, with many European nations in recession. But that's false comfort. To make up the damage of the Great Recession, did to jobs, to income, wealth, and confidence, the economy needs consistent above average growth. Skipping down a couple of paragraphs, the article, the opinion page uh, editorial goes on to say, at the same time, cutbacks in government spending, which are scheduled to deepen next year in keeping with last year's federal budget deal, and which Republicans want to make even deeper, will eat into growth. In the latest figures, government spending cuts shaved 0.6% of a percent, percentage point from growth. Deeper cuts mean more damage, as has been amply demonstrated by self-destructive austerity in Europe. A, parag a stark divide is developing on the campaign trail. President Obama is centering his agenda on policies to address economic inequality, including more manufacturing jobs and educational opportunities. Mitt Romney is focused on tax cuts for the rich, budget cuts for the poor, and on blaming Mr. Obama for the economic shambles created in the Bush years. For now, the policy, the default policy, is to slog on until the end of the year, when lawmakers will be forced to confront the looming federal budget cuts and the simultaneous expiration of the Bush tax cuts, the temporary payroll tax cut, and federal unemployment benefits. The final paragraph states, the fledging recovery beset by lopsided growth will not be helped by a continuation of high-end Bush tax cuts, nor can the weak economy withstand several budget cutbacks. Meanwhile, the uncertainty over future policy is yet another harbinger of continued slow growth. That's the conclusion to the, uh, uh, to the uh, editorial. Just to sum it up, um, I've made a couple of notes here. It advocates 
no tax cuts to stop the budget, that is the budget deficit, and no budget cutbacks and, and to continue government spending. It also advocates clearing up uncertainty. This means uh, that it is advocating high taxes and high government spending. That is, is high government taxes and high government spending, is this good for the economy? The New York Times our, uh, opinion seems to be that it will be. But I've made some notes here on the board that perhaps we should go over and, uh, and then we'll ask our panel. In any economic transaction, You've got your risk, your information and knowledge, your time and your effort, and if it's a service, and if it's a material good, you'll have material. And any, you'll employ all those factors to get a reward. And that reward is a profit. And you can take that reward and you can make a private investment and that produces growth. But if you have high taxation, then the government comes along and takes some of that reward. So then we have to rewrite our notes that our risk, our information, our time, our effort, our material, then produces a reward that we have to share with the government. And it's done by the government operating on this side of the equation, extracts taxes. So we add in the taxes of the government, and the government is then allowed to, ena enabled to go out and spend money. From this, the government has a spending, has an operational expense. So we've included that here. But from that government spending and its operational expenses, it has other uh, uh, objectives. One is its entitlement programs, which is really basically free stuff to its constituents. It's welfare, farm supports, foreign aid. The list is quite lengthy on which government spends its money without any really reward, productive reward coming back. But there are some government spending that does have some reward. There is a purpose for government, after all. And so that's why it exists, and we want the reward of what government can do for us. Well, examples of what it can do, some examples are roads, judicial system, national defense, Self-defense, I should say. There are others. Research is a good one. So, let's get back to the New York Times point. Bigger government, more spending, good or bad? Well, when we compare it to private spending, Private spending, we take our reward, we go straight to a private investment and the growth that can come from that. But in government, you've got a, you've got a drag on government rewards that can come from its spending. It's operational expenses, which we are notoriously inefficient. Who would want anybody who runs the post office or the motor vehicle department to be running a, a high-tech organization. Also, the government's priorities are different from those of a private economic growth-oriented company because its constituents want something for, for free. And so off this money goes. So when the spending goes, to a reward that, we, that 
we have to share with the government. Much of that government portion is inefficient. And so the point here is that if you want big government spending, a stimulus if you will, it's inefficient. The most efficient way to get us on back on the road of prosperity is to allow the private sector to operate as it will. And so with that said, let's find out what our panel thinks. Guys, I'm going to uh, this week start with Rick first. Rick, any initial comments? Yeah, well, we borrowed um, on the order of $5 trillion uh, since uh, Mr. Obama became president for various forms of stimulus and to fund a uh, recurring deficit um, because tax revenues have fallen off. Um, that's added one third to our national debt. Uh, so we're now up to about $15 trillion and counting. Um, I mean, you could argue that that type of stimulus on that order, on that scale, probably would have shown some signs of uh, causing the economy to recover and, gr and grow robustly by now. I mean, I mean, you might ask yourself, what's required? Is it $8 trillion, uh, 10, 15, 20? You know, what's the number? What's the magic number that's actually going to induce some sort of robust recovery? On the other hand, you might conclude that actually a lot of that quote-unquote stimulus was useless. That in fact, the multiplier that affects the economy on the basis of government expenditure is quite a bit less than one. And that therein lies the proof of that. Exactly. Prima facie. Mark? Well, Chris, I think you're going to have a heck of a time trying to stop the Republican Party from its stimulus spending. We like to blame Obama for the $5 trillion in nonsense that he's added to the deficit or to the national debt. But, you know, once the barn doors open, it's hard to criticize the guy who just goes along with the flow. So while all previous Republican administrations' deficits spent their way to prosperity uh, through stimulus programs like the military, the Cold War, uh, how about the implicit guarantee it gives to too big to fail banks? They get a lower cost of capital, and smaller schmo banks in the middle of nowhere pay a higher cost of capital because they do not have that implicit guarantee. So the Republican Party is uh, just as, if not more, guilty, but we didn't hold their feet to the fire the way we do to our current socialist administration, and we probably should. So I would just like to ask you, you know, to consider amongst all your stimulus complaints things like defense. Corporate subsidies, implicit guarantees to too big to fail banks, and every other idiotic scam that uh, uh, Ron Bama is pushing through as we speak. Okay. Um, what about uh, what about the end of the year cliff that may be uh, coming on board here as the uh, tax? Uh, reductions, uh, the Bush tax cuts were uh, as they expire. What do you think will uh, happen uh, with that uh, looming in the future? Is there any chance that that can uh, that these uh, tax cuts will not be uh, extended? Sure, Chris, there's a chance, but one thing that every American can do right now instead of whining about it, because we're going, we're just sinking into a socialist morass, whether we like it or not. One thing every American can do, though, is get on the internet and start looking at American companies that have a lot of cash in their balance sheet. Because come January 1st, the tax rate on dividends goes way up, and so you'll see a lot of special dividend payments by cash rich companies between now and year end. So if you want to get ahead of the curve, take advantage of this, of the, of this tax law, get in the tax system, um, buy the stocks of companies with high cash balances as we speak. 
Yeah, and as a matter of fact, uh, Don Luskin uh, wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, on May 4th uh, entitled, The 2003 Fiscal Cliff Could Crush Stocks, and uh, wrote about this uh, exact same uh, uh, thing that you just uh, mentioned about uh, the you increase You know, Rick, Rick always mentions, you know, 10% across the board cut. If we're not even going to entertain that idea seriously, then you probably do have to raise taxes. Otherwise, you're looking at a Weimar type of inflation. So if we're not going to be serious about cutting spending, we can't even discuss cutting taxes or maintaining their current rates. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. Rick, uh, what, uh, what does this tax increase portend for the future? Well, I think we've seen this movie before in the case of Japan. Uh, from memory, they had a rather large real estate bubble. It collapsed. The government resorted to huge stimulus spending, and they still have lots of bridges to nowhere over there, some of which I've driven across. And then they had the bright idea of raising taxes, and that induced you know, yet a, 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 a follow-on recession, and they've kind of struggled ever since. So uh, this is kind of a generic and predictable pattern that politicians follow as they scramble about looking for, uh, you know, a what they think is a sensible solution. We must cut expenditures. Right? We are running way beyond uh, our ability to fund this government. So that has to be done. That's the starting point. Um, the immediate threat of the taxes is that it will dampen, I and mean, it's money directly out of people's pockets. So it will, it will have a dampening effect in the economy. That's a fact. The, the problem is, by not disso dissociating the two, uh, and the New York Times has a habit of doing that, uh, you lose track of the cause and effect. And also, they don't put, there's no mention of the Japan experience, and there are many other countries who have experienced the same chronology of, of policies. Uh, and so, you know, to me, I think raising taxes at this point in time is, is foolish. Well, I certainly would agree. And uh, this article from, uh, by Luskin uh, certainly points out the, uh, him making the calculations. Uh, he, he mentions about a 30 percent decrease in the, um, in the stock market uh, between now and then should uh, these tax increases uh, not take effect. Uh, Mark, what do you think about the effect on the stock market? Is it going to be severe as these, uh, as these tax increases? Uh, which are probably not going to get extended at least until after the election and, and depending on who is elected, um, may never get extended. Um, do you think it will have a devastating effect on the stock market, uh, Mark? Well, historians like to talk about epiphenomena and the effect of tax cuts or the expiration of tax cuts on the stock market would be a mere epiphenomena. I guess you have to just ask, and Rick walked through the scenario, does it crush the economy? Does it hurt earnings growth? Does it dampen investor belief in continued productivity gains that would lead to higher investment growth over time, uh, higher uh, earnings growth over time? And does that therefore make our stock market less attractive and drive down the price? But, you know, the end of that all uh, is the final conclusion, and it's really more of its effect on the economy. You know, if the stock market, if, by the time this happens, let's, let's say, I know, Chris, you like to look backwards and use the Wall Street Journal to invest backwards in the market by driving with your rearview mirror. But let's say on December 31st, the stock market is yielding 8% and the S&P is selling at a PE of 7 uh, and, and, and the next day, these tax cuts expire. It might be time to go barreling into the market. So again, I like to talk about valuation. I know it's not something that you ever consider in your investment process, but it's important to look at, especially if you're considering this issue. Well, I, I first have to uh, take issue with that last statement that uh, the investment process uh, does take evaluation into it. Uh, the right report uh, in every single headline has an evaluation component to it. Otherwise, it doesn't get in there. Um, 
So, uh, but then to uh, to get past that, and to uh, yeah, uh, and I, I agree with you. And uh, so let's actually let's move on to a slightly different topic, but one that parallels this: Greece. Um, on May 17th, the New York Times, uh, uh, the famous economist uh, Paul Krugman uh, wrote an article, uh, uh, in an op-ed piece there called "The Apocalypse Fairly Soon," and referred to uh, uh, to Greece and to the. Uh, the amount of unemployment there, he says, uh, Greece is for the uh, for the moment. The focal point voters are understandably angry at policies that have produced 22 percent unemployment, more than 50 percent among the young. And uh, he states that it's very possible this whole thing could unravel in the next couple of weeks, and uh, probably, and it, and it may well. Uh, and it may, well, it, it may well do that. Think that'll have any effect or uh, significance on our economy? Uh, can I interject here? Sure. In a, in a couple of ways. Um, first of all, according to the uh, journal today, the trailing PE for, the, for both the S&P and, and Dow Jones is around 13, 13.5 times. And the Ford PE uh, is around 11 plus. Um, the market is, it has turned, uh, in my view, mainly because our earnings growth is starting to flatten, and the market's looking through that for, in the United States anyway. Uh, and if you look at the external environment, there's a slowdown going in China and Brazil and. Europe and so on and so forth. So external demand outside of the United States is not looking very good. So most investors, I would reckon, are looking around the world. They're looking at the usual pattern of earnings of, of, of analysts uh, three months to six months after the fact, lowering their earnings forecast because that's what analysts tend to do. Um, and so I, 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 I it would have been surprising if the market hadn't started to level off and decline at this stage in the earnings cycle. So let me just that, that, let me set that as the background. Secondly, there was another article uh, that came out today about Iceland. All right, Iceland has its own currency, and they in fact are starting to recover. Their real businesses, not banking. The nonsense banking that went on, went on over there, and the ridiculous lending, and the, steely, the silly real estate investment, all that stuff. The real businesses like catching cod and uh, their other uh, uh, mineral resources business are, uh, businesses are starting to recover nicely. And uh, actually, employment's up and the economy's growing. Uh, uh, I can't remember if it's three or four percent, but. You know, was it only a year ago that Iceland was uh, considered a complete basket case and would take years and years to recover? What actually happened? Well, the currency collapsed. Uh, suddenly, Icelandic goods are very, very cheap, and no surprise, people start to buy them. What if Greece went back to its own currency, the drachma, right, and devalued? How many Germans and Englishmen and Frenchmen would start vacationing in Greece and start buying Greek goods, um, olives, for example, uh, because they're such a bargain? I find no threat whatsoever if Greece goes off the euro. Zero. It'd be, the market would love it. Here, here. Uh, absolutely agree. Go ahead, Mark. The market might love it. But you might find one or two banks with some very powerful lobbyists who have some great bonds in their back pocket who would run forward and put an end to the nice scenario that Rick painted because God knows that they didn't want to present a quarter down earnings. <laughs> but, you know, we get the government we deserve. We get it good and hard. We're a nation of rent seekers and we're paying the price. Right. And, um, so uh, what's your feeling about uh, the market from here going forward uh, with uh, the, gr uh, the looming Greece problem, which may be followed by Portugal and, and uh, Portugal, Spain, and uh, Italy uh, right afterwards? Mark? 
No, I'm, I'm with Rick. I mean, I want to see Greece. The New York Times today gave 50 reasons why Greece shouldn't leave the euro, why it would be devastating, you know, how imports represent a small portion of their economy. They've got no manufacturing base, blah, 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 blah. Well, guess what? In 1976, Vietnam had no manufacturing base. In 1946, Japan had no manufacturing base. Uh, remember when we were kids, every time you flipped something over, it said made in Hong Kong? Hong Kong used to have no manufacturing base. These were all very cheap and expensive places. The world adjusts to opportunity. The, you know, they're, they're, the New York Times is reactionary. They won't let this happen. Oh, no, change is going to happen. Someone might make a profit. Capitalism is a four-letter word. I say bring it on. I have to agree with you. And uh, you made a nice point there. Uh, uh, and uh, Rick did also uh, in his example of Iceland, uh, in the sense that production, production is the core uh, to the value of money. So without, without production, money has no value. And so our economic uh, transaction is a reward from actual production, production using the various variables that go into it. And the problem, you know, the problem for the New York Times and the liberal elite is their vision of one world government where everybody's holding hands uh, and on the same currency and, uh, you know, the borderless societies and all this stuff is being very visibly undermined by the European experiment. And the fact that that's being exposed is an enormous source, source of embarrassment and therefore cannot be tolerated. Yeah, I mean, it's being a borderless society, you know, the Reagan amnesty, we've got McCain pushing for amnesty, we've got Nick Harris pushing for amnesty. The Republican Party uh, wants to tear down the borders tomorrow, so we're left with no choice. Okay. Um, guys, I want to thank you for your comments. Uh, I thought today was uh, particularly cogent. And so we'll conclude uh, today's Philosophical Angle. Thank you for joining. Thank you.